Hello and welcome. We are um, gathering today to have our second webinar in our wellness webinar series, Learning Together Remotely, Navigating Education in the COVID Era. And we're gonna give everyone some time to log on because uh, we have uh, over 100 people registered to attend uh, our webinar today. And thank you all. So while people are joining, um, I'm just going to, I don't know, tell you a little bit about uh, NewsHawk. So um, during just all of the uncertainty we've been dealing with, uh, we've, we've worked very hard to help the community stay connected, which is, which is why we're happy to be offering this webinar. Um, we want to thank our Hawks Club members who support us through monetary donations so we can cover the news that matters most to you. Uh, to support our community and our 2020 graduates, uh, NewsHawk is offering a Celebrating the Class of 2020 directory that's live on our site right now. If you have a high school graduate um, and wish to celebrate them, then we invite you to submit their photo and your message to be included in our special section. We currently have close to 300 students uh, already uh, that have um, been uh, submitted by loved ones, but we'd love to have more. Uh, to make your submission, you can click on the promotional ads running throughout our website, or you can just go to the school section of NewsHawk and click on the link. Uh, con congratulations to the class of 2020 to make your submission. There's no cost to submit a photo um, and uh, a message to your graduates, so please take advantage of that. Uh, since this is a webinar on education, we thought this would be a nice thing to spotlight as we uh, have people join us. We, we also wanna thank our sponsor today, the Santa Barbara Education Foundation, who has brought this panel together. They are an integral part of our community and we appreciate all that they do. So again, thank you all for joining us and people are still um, logging in. So we will begin our webinar in just about two minutes. If you've just joined us, thank you for logging on. We are going to wait about two more minutes for some of the other attendees to join the webinar and then we will get started. Okay, it looks like um, we have the majority of people joining us and I'm going to go ahead and start uh, the webinar now. Thank you for joining us for our 
wellness webinar series. Second in our series is Learning Together Remotely, Navigating Education in the COVID Era. Uh, today's webinar, the format will be uh, 40 minutes or so of discussion and then followed by about 15 minutes of um, Q&A at the end and then we'll kind of wrap up at the end, maybe a few minutes. Um, if you have a question that you'd like to submit for consideration at the end of the discussion, please click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen and type the question in. Feel free to direct any of your questions to one of the panelists specifically by name um, or to the group in general. So, uh, in support of the Santa Barbara Unified School District, the Santa Barbara Education Foundation has gathered a handful of educators who have worked to help local youth stay engaged during these complicated times. Our panelists will explore the challenges and lessons students and educators face in the era of virtual schooling, and they are. We have uh, Bill Woodard, principal at Dos Pueblos High School, Bill is in his fourth year serving as principal of Dos Pueblos High School. Before that, he served as assistant principal and English teacher at Dos Pueblos. He is a proud graduate of UCLA and father to a current and soon to be DP student. Also joining us today, we have Kelly Choi, who is the director of the Academy for Success. Kelly Choi has been a teacher for 24 years, 22 of them at Dos Pueblos High School. The majority of her career has been as a math teacher. In 2008, she co-founded Santa Barbara Unified's Academy for Success program and has been a teacher and a director of the program since then. Mrs. Choi said, was Santa Barbara County's Teacher of the Year in 2014. We also have with us today, Allie Cortez with the Santa Barbara Unified School District. Allie works through the the district as a clinical outreach, uh, a clinical youth outreach worker. She provides trauma focused interventions, case management, advocacy, mentorship, mediations, workshops, empowerment groups, and therapy to at risk adolescents and families. She is the co founder and program director of the Wonder Woman Workshop, as well as the executive director of A Different Point of View. Also, today we have Brendan Carroll. He is a STEAM teacher, which is science, technology, engineering, art, and math. Wow, talk about a man of all hats at Franklin Elementary. Uh, Brennan has worked in California public schools for almost 30 years. Currently, he is the STEAM teacher at Franklin Elementary and works with the entire range of students from transitional kindergarten to sixth grade. During his career, he has worked as a gate teacher, science specialist, and has been a regular classroom in grades three, four, five, and six. And last but not least, we have Joanna Pascone, music teacher at Franklin Elementary School. Joanna is an alumnus of Azusa Pacific University where she received both a Bachelor of Arts in Music Education and a single subject teaching credential. Although Joanna studied opera during her years at Azusa Pacific, she is also a classically trained dancer and has brought various styles of dance into her music classroom for the past seven years. So welcome everyone. And you can see our panelists have joined us. So um, we'll go ahead and start with our questions. Uh, I will pose the question to a particular panelist and then if the other panelists would like to um, add their comments, uh, that's what we'll do. So um, Bill, I'll start with you. Thank you. So Bill, um, what are some of the most significant challenges that you see our youth facing during school closures and the implementation of remote learning? Yeah, there are many. Um, thank you for having me, by the way. Um, I, I guess I'll, I'll, the, the two that are at the top of the list for me, uh, one is just the nature of how the school closure happened. It was very sudden in March. Students were not expecting it. Uh, and teachers were not expecting it to be for the rest of the school year. And so they didn't have any sort of warning that it was coming closure that that was their last day with their teachers uh, and their, their friends. And so the, I guess in the Maslow hierarchy of needs, there are a lot of unmet needs in terms of just simply emotional safety uh, and also physical safety and comfort. You know, the parents were losing their, their jobs, 
Uh, there was food insecurity issues. And on top of that, now you have to shift the way you're learning at, at home. Uh, some didn't have home environments that were conducive to um, remote learning. Uh, some still don't, frankly. Um, and so there was all those things happening. And then when we, when we launched that, uh, when we launched the remote learning uh, program, they had to shift gears into how they're going to learn. And since at our school, in the high school level, there was so much focus on project-based exper experiential learning, teachers really struggled with how to shift gears into or doing that in a remote fashion. Um, they're still figuring it out. They're doing a great job figuring it out, and the students have really um, have risen to the occasion. But the challenges about doing this on the fly um, you know, the, the biggest analogy people are me making is that we aren't really doing distance learning or remote learning. We're doing emergency COVID-19 response learning. Mm. And therefore, not having any preparation for that was extremely challenging as we rolled it out. I can imagine. And I have um, some daughters in school. So um, I think everyone's done a fabulous job just given the circumstances, as you pointed out. It's not like you had any um, warning. Uh, so the next question I'm going to pose to um, Joanna. Uh, so do you see any benefits to the remote learning model compared to traditional on-site instruction? Um, so my favorite part about all of this has been really the sense of community and not just within Santa Barbara, but the glo global community. Uh, as soon as COVID hit and all the schools were shut down, my inbox was just flooded with people trying to help and give resources that could be accessed to students online. Um, so the global aspect of suddenly uh, having access to the Berlin Orchestra or the LA Phil or, uh, you know, ballet companies in New York has been incredible. Um, so that's been a huge, huge advantage of the online learning is just how much help and support that we're getting. Uh, from the glo global community. Um, and then the other aspect that I really enjoy is that the students have to become more independent in their learning. Um, for better or for worse, they are in charge of their schedule. Uh, that's been really wonderful for me to have a completely flexible schedule. And if I have a clarinet student who needs help at seven o'clock at night, it's no big deal because we just hop onto Zoom and have a quick little lesson. Um, and then somewhat aligned with that is also their independent drive to learn more. Uh, they have so much more information. We're really teaching the students how to be their own learners and how do you find the resources to learn about the subjects that you're most interested in so that when you, uh, the student is learning about X in class, it's not just what I have to teach them, but it's also now you have all of these resources that you can go to to delve more into that subject if it's something that particularly interests them. So what grades do you primarily teach? I am with Brendan. We teach t uh, transitional kindergarten through sixth grade. Okay. And so how are you addressing, how are you teaching music virtually? <laughs> it's been interesting, um, especially with music. It's uh, one of the benefits of having a music education is the communal aspect of it, which obviously we're not getting a lot of right now. Um, with the younger grades, uh, we do a lot of little videos on YouTube, but I put it together in a format so that they're learning, um, like we did tempo recently. So we had a song about slow and fast and we'll, we can have Zoom classes as well. Uh, where the students log in and then I'm leading them through a regular music class. It's just with extra technology. Um, and then the upper grades, uh, fourth, fifth, and sixth, all study an instrument, either orchestra or band, any instrument of their choice. Yeah, great. Well, thank you. Um, so we'll move on to our, our next question. And um, I'm going to ask Allie and um, Brendan to, to address this. So Allie, you can go first. But the question is, what are the most significant barriers for student success in regards to remote learning? Um, thank you so much for having us here. I have to say that, you know, I, it's such an honor to be part of this incredible team. What the school district did in 
the span of a week, maybe even two, was what usually um, you know institutions do in months, in maybe even a year. So it's incredible how they mobilized and really responded to the needs of and trying to respond to all the needs. Um, you know, no amount of remote learning is going to compare to the connection of a human being. So the main barrier that I think we are seeing is the humanizing of technology. Um, that's really across the board. Um, there's just no comparison to someone seeing you and seeing um, what you're going through and just see, looking at your eyes and saying, I see you, I, I, I hear you also. Um, Upon all this, though, there is also, we are all on the same ocean. We keep hearing the analogy of, you know, we're on the same boat and, and we're not, you know, we're all on the same ocean and everybody's in a different place and we have to acknowledge that. And I feel like the school district does everything they possibly can. Um, you know, when we're talking about marginalized communities like the Spanish speaking community. Um, there is a lot of barriers, for example, you know, the transportation, if you need to get your iPad fixed, that it, they might not have a car. It's dangerous to go on the bus. There is a lot of fear. There's also a lot of um, news that is not, um, you know, positive news. It's not even real news, like, you know, like facts of what's going on. So there is a lot of fear. Also, what I've seen recently is there is a spike in health issues. So I'm seeing a spike in the families that I'm working with, with um, symptoms, and they're not talking about it. They're not going to the clinics or the hospital, again, out of fear. Um, you know, the priority of education is not the first one, unfortunately, and it's not that they don't want to, it's the fact that we're surviving this pandemic and um, we need our, the siblings to be taking of, care of each other, um, food, lost jobs, um, there's just, it's a whole different level of stressors that um, are interfering with the ability to really focus um, on your education and your future. So those are some main barriers that I think um, we're doing the best we can, but they are still very present. Thank you. Um, Brendan, do you want to add something to that? Yeah, I think that, um, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for having me. And it's such an honor to be with so many professionals that have so many creative answers to this unusual situation. And I think that from my perspective, as sort of a classroom teacher like Joanna, that has could have hundreds of students come through my room each day, um, especially as Bill mentioned, also hands-on programs. I think that's one of the drawbacks of remote learning is that we don't have the actual physical materials to give the students. So personally, I've been trying to design engineering or science lessons based on my guesswork of what they should have at home. Like we've, we've done origami and we've done growing sugar and salt crystals or, or creating boats out of aluminum foil. And so again, this is sort of a patchwork band-aid situation. And, um, but, look at, but as educators, as professionals, we're already looking ahead to the fall wondering how can we cleanse or sanitize 50 pairs of scissors and, and cardboard and, and robots when we have so many kids coming through. And I mean, part of the answer might be that we take half the usual class and maybe this will relieve some of the burden on the regular classroom teachers that music and art and PE that we're obviously already taking lots of students, but we're gonna have to do it in a much more systematic way to almost relieve the, the pressure numbers in the classroom. and. I just want to point out some of the benefits though I do enjoy in remote learning. So for me, uh, obviously not having the kids there, I thought one of the benefits is that I can go off campus and I can record videos and I can create stories that will engage the kids. So, you know, we when we grew crystals, I went up in the mountains up to Lizard's Mouth to look at the local geology. Or when we did boats, I ended up down at the harbor uh, encountering the evil Dr. Lorak on his island. Um, he turns out to be not so bad a guy, but anyway, so just learning to use our creativity to, to create um, a reason for the students to come to our Zoom meeting. So I'd sort of prime the pump with an interesting video that incorporates an activity. And then in the Zoom situation, I could actually walk through the steps with students. But like Ali and Bill are saying, and Joanna, that really having that human contact and trying to meet those individual needs is very, challenging, um, especially if you're trying to do hands-on projects or, um, you know, build something over time. So it's, it's positive and negative for sure. Yeah. Well, just some of the things that you just shared, like going up and 
videotaping the crystals at Lizard's mouth and going down to the harbor. I mean, I applaud you for doing those kinds of things. And I think that it's, it's those teachers that take, you know, a bad situation and just find a way to be innovative and make the best out of, um, you know, circumstances uh, that, that we need to really be grateful for. So thank you. Um, so let's move on to our, our next question. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pose this to Kelly. Um, so Kelly, what, hi, um, what lessons have you learned uh, as an educator from teaching remotely? And maybe you can give a little bit of background about the um, program that you run, you know, to give people a sort of perspective. Oh, sure, okay, well, thank you for having me today. This has been really nice. Um, the background of our program, the Academy for Success is about 12 years old, and um, we target students who have been unsuccessful in the school system and basically give them all the supports we can possibly think of. So academic, emotional supports, um, and really work towards their personal and academic um, success and growth. Uh, so when this hit, like Bill mentioned earlier, we, you know, we had no idea March 13th was gonna be the last day of school. And because of the relationships that the teachers have built with our students, um, our students, our, <laughs> our immediate answers were, don't worry, next week we'll have like a couple hours on campus that you can come and be a part of it. And, um, you know, quickly we found out that's not gonna happen. And so I think, um, we just were really pleased that the relationships were so strong in our program already that we had access to our students immediately and were able to really calm their nerves and help them feel like we're all, we're all there together to figure out the next steps. Um, which back to your question, I think what, what I've learned as an educator and I think my fellow teachers have too is, wow, we've learned a lot. <laughs> um, you know, obvious things like we've all learned how to Zoom now. And um, even though that's kind of a joke in a way now, um, in the beginning, it was very stressful for everyone. Um, but the very cool part about that was, and, and what we're all learning now is that there are a lot of things us as teachers have wanted to do for a long time. And we've been in a cycle that hasn't really allowed us as teachers to really have time to, to get out there and try it or learn it. And um, all of a sudden, we were all forced into a certain level of skill, like learning Zoom, learning some of the technology. And the creativity that has come out of the teachers has just been completely admirable. I mean, I just has been breathtaking in moments where I've talked with teachers about what they're trying to do. And even the simple tool of, of Zoom has become where you can use breakout sessions and have small group meetings with kids. And normally in a classroom, you walking over to a group of four students is, and giving them their full attention is not that easy because you're managing all 36 students in the classroom. Um, but on Zoom, while you're you know, in these breakout rooms, you're able to you know, focus on just those students and the learning has just increased so much in those kinds of environments. So I think we learned a lot of tools and some new tools. And I think there were other things that were just, I think teachers have known for a while aren't working. And I think those things were confirmed, I think, um, or, or working. We know that relationships are really essential for students. And um, I think that this really affirmed that if, if the relationship is there, the students are going to still be able to continue to learn. Um, however creatively we try to come up with. Thank you. All right, so Allie, I'm gonna ask you this next question. Um, how, how should we be reaching out to our community's most vulnerable youth right now? Yeah, thank you, that's such a good question. Um, and Kelly hit it right off the bat. It's the relationship, you know, if you already have a relationship with it, with the student, um, keep it alive. Really, really send the message. And um, if there's any barriers like the ones we have talked about, um, there's so many creative ways there right now. It's incredible also the, um, you can be very, uh, uh, what's the word? Um, imaginative. You can be really open with a lot of different um, ways to support our youth. Like I've had 
one-on-one -on -one connections on Zoom, which I'm so grateful. As much as there is Zoom fatigue, I am still really grateful that I can connect um, either sometimes through FaceTime, but it could be as much as like, I see you and I can see that you're not looking well, right? Um, or I can also hear it in your voice. And I've had some interactions where I ask them, what is it that really makes you happy? What is it that really lightens you up? And that's kind of talking into the inspiration and the hope to keep them going, to keep their mental health really stable. And um, like in one case, one of the youth was, you know, really just kind of going down, um, feeling depressed and a lot of symptoms. And I, I, what is one thing that you love? Oh, well, I haven't done any bike riding. I'm like, okay, 10 minutes. I'm going to be right here. You're going to go on your bike right now and you're going to go and you're going to circle for 10 minutes and then you're going to come back. And then, the student walks in and you could just see just this like joyous, just like I'm alive again. I'm like, see, I told you. So it's like a lot of coaching in these ways and using anyway. I, I unfortunately sometimes can't connect with some of the students. So I call home. I'm like, I'm going to call, you know, your parent. And I want your parent to also know and your guardian to know that you're not alone, that there's someone who is really concerned and cares about you. And I might have to coach them as well on how to talk to you. Um, and I do a lot of care packages, uh, even if it's a little lollipop, a sticker. I mean, just that physical presence that I was at your home um, and I dropped off a little something for you um, goes a long way and it starts opening doors and then listening. Um, as adults, we are protective factors and we have a lot of information. We have a lot of things we want them to learn and do during this time. And when we connect with them, have the opportunity to them just to decompress and talk about what's going on um, goes a long way. Like I had a student who um, she loves doing art and she has, wasn't doing it. And I immediately went with the assumption. I was like, okay, well, maybe it's your siblings. Maybe you don't have the time. Maybe you're super stressed. Um, after listening, I found out you don't have headphones. I, went to, I thought every teen has headphones. Um, and I found out that she didn't have headphones. I asked her and she said it kind of also like embarrassed. And I said, no worries. Guess what? I have an extra set of headphones, which is why I'm using these. But I just went and delivered them to her home and she's been painting along and now she's, you know, really embarking on her passion. So there's also the opportunity of tuning into their passions and what they're really interested in. And thankfully, there's these incredible um, teachers, you know, who are really making the, the learning experience as engaging as possible. So a lot of just engaging. Yeah, great. Thank you. And I can... You know, being a teacher is challenging as it is because you have to get through the curriculum. You have certain, you know, ways you need to proceed through the, the materials and benchmarks and whatnot. But then on top of all of that, you've got the emotional angst of just what's going on around all of us. And, you know, it just makes your job even that much more challenging and that much more, um, you know, difficult. Uh, so... Some of the things that you pointed out, just the little touches, reaching out, sending things, or just telling someone, go outside, run around the block, or ride your bike, um, great. I mean, I'm a big advocate for, for exercise to you know, lift your mood and your spirits. And um, so thank you, that's great. Uh, so Bill, I'm gonna ask this next question uh, of you. What can we, uh, as community members do to support teachers and students during this time? What, what do you need from us? Um, everybody wash your hands and practice good hygiene so we can get back to normal as soon as possible will be the number one thing you can all do. <laughs> um, all, well, it's not joking aside, but our community, we're fortunate in Santa Barbara Goli to have all these wonderful support uh, networks of nonprofits that are eager to help out and both in the mental health space uh, and in the educational supporting teachers that Santa Barbara Ed Foundation does a great job in teacher grants and giving support to schools to, to do um, creative things. And we're gonna need to rely on that even more so going forward. I would say also, um, I think the community needs to know, from my perspective as a principal, it, it sometimes gets challenging because everybody's going through a different, as, as Ali said, in a different boat or a canoe <laughs> or, or yacht, right? Um, and so I'll go from a conversation with a parent about their high performing student struggling with trying to manage, you know, grading and worrying about college and SATs. And I'll get off the phone with that parent. And then I'll have a parent says, my moderate to severely disabled student who relied on his paraeducator to help him learn can't do that now at home. And they'll be in tears about what can I do to help? 
So I think the first thing I would like the community to do is know that everybody's situation is different. Um, and just because we're, it doesn't mean we're not focusing on every, every situation. Nobody is less important or more important, um, but we do need to work together. And I guess the last thing I'll say, there's sometimes an apprehension among people to share their feedback with us or with teachers feeling like they're gonna come across as not supporting the teachers or critical of the schools. Um, we want your feedback. We, we welcome it. We're trying to figure this out too. We are not, we didn't get trained in running a high school <laughs> during a pandemic. So we're relying on each other and supporting each other through that. So patience, but also if it's done the right way, your ideas are great. And I know a lot of the community is like, how am I going to go back to work if my student's going to be in a hybrid environment in the fall or at home? We can't do that. And so we're going to need to partner even more so with the community to figure these things out. Um, and I would like us all to lock arms together and care as much about, yes, your student, but also the students that, that you see, they may, you may not see and not, may not know their experiences that are really needing the community's support just as much. And if we do that, I think we're going to be much more successful. Very well said. Does anyone want to add anything to that on the panel? Oh, okay. You spoke for them all. Good job. Maybe that's why you're the principal. <laughs> all right. Um, so uh, our next question, um, and I'm going to address this to um, Kelly and Allie. Uh, so Kelly, what, what can parents and guardians in particular do at home to help support their students? Um, you know, now, obviously, we have a lot of graduating seniors who aren't going to have the same experience um, that they've hoped for, dreamed of, proms were canceled, grad night, all of that, a lot of loss. Um, and then you have um, people that are returning to school. Uh, they don't really know what that'll look like. You also have younger children who, you know, really need that hands-on personal experience. So um, to, to lay some of those anxieties and fears, what, what would you suggest the parents can do at home to help and guardians? Yeah. Uh, I actually have two daughters. Uh, one is here at Dos Pueblos and one is graduate promoting from GB next week. Uh, so I'm getting to experience, I think, a lot of what our parents are experiencing also. Um, so I'm on both sides at the same time. And I think um, I, I, I think I have two main pieces of advice. My first would be um, to acknowledge uh, the loss that they're feeling um, about their friendship time, graduation, you know, ceremony, what they thought it was gonna be, or prom or whatever it is, acknowledge their anxiety, acknowledge that they're feeling that way. Don't try to fix it. Just let them, just let them say it, let them feel it, let them cry it, tell them it's okay to cry, tell them they should grieve it because it's something they lost. And it's something that we're going to regain and there, there are things that we will change and we will gain those connections back, but there, it, we have no idea what it's going to look like yet. And, and what we do know is that we all want to be together. We want to all feel connected. We don't want to feel isolated. And so everyone is working towards that same common goal. Um, I think l listening to them would be really, really huge, just listening. Um, and then I think my second piece of advice would be really encourage them to think about themselves as learners and not so much about getting grades. Um, and, and really, these are such great opportunities. Teachers are giving kids all these super creative ways to do things. And I think it's a, it's a really great opportunity for parents to be like, you know, you, you love, I mean, they, Brendan mentioned earlier, like um, origami, you love origami. You know, let's go after that. Let's learn some more about that or help them look up more things that kind of interest them where if you see some energy that they have around it, I would say, get on board with that and don't worry so much about the traditional assignments that um, may or may not even be assigned anymore, um, but more about like, what are they as learners and how are they how are they feeling as learners and, and what makes them feel really proud of their learning? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Allie, did you want to add something to that? Yeah, um, I know we're all grieving, all of us. Um, I personally, graduation day is like my graduation. So because like I've 
been with them through the highs and lows. I've, I've had relationships since they were like in seventh grade all, and they're graduating. And um, each one of us has our own story of grieving currently. And um, it's just so important to remember that, you know, be so compassionate to yourself as an adult. Um, you are now at home the ambassador of this new world. And um, that's scary because we don't know, like there's, <laughs> we're all winging it and that's okay. There's no perfection. Um, be so good to yourself. And, and it, right now it's survival of who does the most self-care and really takes care of themselves. Um, that's part of your social, emotional, you know, skills and flaunt them right now. Um, and that's a lot of taking care of yourself. And remember, you know, going on the development right now of a young person, they're not fully developed. The part that is fully developed is the reward center in their brain. So that's getting punched like every day. So, um, you know, it, your, your prefrontal cortex is fully developed and use it to the max and love it and take care of it, eat well, um, feed yourself really healthy thoughts um, because your serenity and your poise and the way you make decisions from here on is being looked upon a lot more. Um, again, every adult right now is a, health, is a protective factor in the next generation and that's a big task. So we're all leaders and then if you're the leader at home, you know, address yourself as a leader, you know, take care of yourself as a leader and really embrace this journey. And remember that there's no perfect way. Nobody knows exactly. We didn't like, <laughs> Bill, we didn't get a, a manual on this. So we're building the plan as we go. So, you know, um, uh, engage and inspire um, yourself. That's most important. Yeah, definitely. I agree hundred percent. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna move on to our last question. So just a reminder to the audience, if you have a question that you would like us to present to the panelists uh, towards the end of the webinar, go ahead and click on the Q and A at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and you can type your question in there. Um, go to the Q and A and and not the chat, okay, to pose that question. So the final question, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask three of your opinions, and Joanne, I'm gonna start with you. Uh, so. Uh, what changes do you see for our schools once on-site um, instruction resumes? I definitely think there's going to be more of a hybrid learning. Uh, one of, as I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the benefits of all of this is just how my inbox was flooded with resources that I can suddenly use. And there is definitely value in those even in a regular learning experience. Um, so I would, I'd like to see, you know, we were forced into learning these programs suddenly. We had no closure, um, and a lot of creativity comes from that point of vulnerability. So I would like to see that continue. And I think there's definitely a place for it. One of the programs that I've used, um, at, with my instrumental students, they end up submitting individual recordings and the program grades them as they play. That's something I could never do. I have nearly 300 kids playing instruments. I don't have the time to really listen to every individual clarinet and saxophone and violin to see if they're getting it exactly right. But this program can, and then I can go back in later and re-listen and re-score, but it doesn't have to be every single moment. Oh, that's, yeah. that's fascinating. That's great. Yeah. The other thing that I'd like to see is um, I want to see the students come back to, to in-person education with a greater sense of drive to learn as an individual. Uh, this is a time where they've really gotten to explore what they're interested in, some, what, uh, some of what Kelly was talking about, where, you know, they're really interested in origami. Great. Go focus and be good at origami. Um, I think that they're learning a lot of life skills, you know, the older ones are learning how to cook lunch for their little siblings and there's a lot of value and courage that comes from that. So I hope to see that the students will come back onto campus with a greater sense of confidence and grounding in who they are and who they want to become. Thank you. All right, the origami master, Brennan. Can you give us some of your experts? Uh, yeah, and I want to reiterate what, what Kelly and Allie and Joanna and, and Bill and others have been saying is that I think that 
when students come back, I think we really have to value their individual interests more. We've uh, talked about special ed students always have their own 504 or specialized plan based on their abilities and where we want them to go. And in education, like I said, I've been in it a while, there's often been talk about extending that to the regular students, giving them individual you know, education plans. So the more we can, can honor that, and I think, again, talking back to parents working at home, uh, whatever interest your student has, we, we have to sort of take apart our, our, our idea of what learning is or what the goal is. I mean, for us, teaching them critical thinking skills and creative thinking is really the goal. And so, yes, we do have to learn multiplication facts and we do have to know certain parts of history, but really getting them to be individual thinkers and learners and have that growth mindset that they can learn and based on that learning, it will take them to new places. So again, having teachers that are enthusiastic about what they're doing will encourage the students to pursue their own interests. So when we come back, I'm hoping that we have a little more flexibility in, in honoring uh, individual students' interests. And um, I know that at Franklin, you know, some recesses all have students come into the STEAM room where I'll have materials and tools they can play with. So there's always those students who don't necessarily want to play dodgeball every recess. And there's students that go to the music room with Joanna or the art room. And I think we need to be a open up our idea of, of what the campus and resources can be for students. At least at the elementary level, I think we have a little more flexibility because as teachers, we teach all the subjects. So again, I think when we come back, there'll be a little more project-based learning, I hope, because it incorporates so many different skills and that within those projects, there'll be some room for individuality. So those are my thoughts. Yeah, and you know, those are good takeaways. I mean, sometimes when tragedy hits, some of the best ideas are born from that. And that's kind of what I'm hearing from a lot of you. And that's very encouraging. Um, yeah, I, I had that thought as well during this uh, webinar that you know often technology it accelerates its development during times of war or during times of disaster. And this certainly counts as kind of half of each of those. And the other analogy I had, we keep coming back to the boat for some reason, but um, I, I do think of the of school campuses as a ship and the principals, the, the captain and the crew is the staff and our guests or the fellow sailors are the students. And, you know, where, there we were in March and we could just see on the horizon, we could see summer, just had to get through the turbulent waters of testing. And then the love boat suddenly flipped over and became the Poseidon adventure. And uh, suddenly we had to do what we were doing, but upside down in the dark. So um, we're making our way to port still, but I think uh, when we set sail in the fall, we'll certainly have a lot more preparation and ideas uh, ready to go. Thank you. Um, and Kelly, maybe you can just weigh in on that final question and I'll just, you know, what, what changes do you see for our schools once on-site instruction resumes? Uh, I, I see a lot of change coming actually, and I'm super excited about all of it. Um, I think at the high school level, uh, um, a lot of times, a lot of students feel more forced to be at school and forced to be learning. And I've seen a total transformation in our students' mental state about learning. And they're realizing that they're only gonna learn if they wanna learn right now, right? There's no teacher being like, you're going to do this. You know, that it, it, it's definitely more ownership about their learning. And so that's very exciting. I think students coming back with that new mental state of, I am so happy to be here at school. That's going to be really great. Um, but I also see, um, I see teachers thinking more about um, the skills that we need to teach our students and what, if we teach these skills that the students need, um, how, how they show us that they have learned those skills can be in a variety of ways. And I think teachers are much more open to that now. Um, I think it's something that touches on what Brendan was saying, where that personalization comes up, where maybe we're all going to learn how to analyze, but maybe one student's going to learn how to analyze how roller coasters work, and one student's going to analyze a poem based on what they're interested in. And I think, I think teachers starting to focus on those essential skills is, I'm hearing a lot of talk um, about that amongst not just the um, academy's 
for success teachers, but the teachers across, you know, in, in all kinds of areas. Um, and I think the last thing that um, is there's a lot of talk about for next year and, and moving forward is about grades. I mean, there was a lot of controversy about grading and a lot of, of um, realizations about where grading is weak and what what's the difference between grading and giving students feedback. And the, you know, one of the greatest ways students learn is from feedback and not a letter grade doesn't necessarily do that. And so I think there's a lot of conversations with teachers about how we're going to provide feedback rather than putting emphasis on grades um, so that that learning and that excitement and engagement and learning can continue. Yeah, all, all great things to keep in mind. Um, all right. Well, those are the questions that I have for all of you. So we are going to now turn to um, our uh, questions from some of the audience participants. So um, let's see. So I have... I need. Okay, so um, this question is for um, for Bill. Um, how how do you see the extracurricular sports and arts programs playing out um, next year? Um. I'll start by saying it's a great question. And I, I think one of the takeaways for how schools are gonna change is we're going to appreciate those experiences and those opportunities for students so much more. I, I coached the mock trial team at DP for 10 years and I will argue with anybody that they learned more about reading, writing, arguing, and, and debating in that experience than they ever did in my English classroom. And I thought I was pretty good, pretty good AP Lit teacher as well. Um, those experiences are crucial to, to the, especially at the high school level, but I think at all levels to learning. Um, certainly athletics is up in the air in terms of what schools look like and the argument about if, if we can't be back all together with students in a classroom, and I'm hoping we can at one point, um, how can we do uh, you know, football and whatnot? So those are TBD. I know the CIF came out with a, a, a blueprint for waiting as long as possible before they make the decisions on inter uh, scholastic sports because they want to see how things develop and they are committed to trying to do uh, this seasons, maybe even delayed, but still doing the seasons. The arts is actually a great place where we can see a lot of uh, creative creativity. I'm seeing a lot right now. Our, our teachers just uh, shared their virtual arts show. And kind of one of the cool things is at the normal uh, end of the year art show in our library, we have, you know, we have like 100 to 200 people we were able to put it on social media, put it out to all our parents and students. And I think we greatly increased the number of students who were exposed to the talented artists that we have. Other students uh, organized an online art festival for music and film and photo and, and visual arts. Um, so we're going to work really hard to keep those experiences and enhance them where we can, uh, knowing how important and vital they are. Uh, Kelly and I are both parents of uh, soon to be seniors and and incoming freshmen, <laughs> we share that in common. And we both have had moments where we've talked about how, how we're just pleading for some sort of normalcy so they can have all those experiences that you remember in high school, the homecoming, the football games on Friday nights, the drama performances. Uh, I, I wanna do everything we can to find ways to keep those experiences for our kids. Yeah, I think everybody does. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask another question. Um, and whoever feels um, that they want to speak to it, uh, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. So the question is, what are some of the possibilities and opportunities for children with special needs, from the severe to the moderate range to the mild and to the gifted? What supports could there be for parents as well as the children as we move into the next school year? Um, I'll jump in just a little bit. Um, for the students who have special needs, 
often they are quite musical. That's actually often one of their greatest strengths. Um, and obviously it's different because you won't have the added benefit of the social emotional health that you get from being in a music group. Um, but I would really encourage students and parents who have students with special needs to dive into different music programs, uh, let the student express themselves through dance uh, or through just listening or trying to conduct. Uh, now's a wonderful time for them to try and pick up an instrument like uh, guitar and piano are always my go-tos for if students are trying to learn on their own the piano because it's literally black and white so you can find the correct note pretty easily and then guitar just because it's so portable um, so i would encourage this to be a time to explore non-academic paths anyone else have anything they want to add i'll, I'll just add that uh, like students that have special needs our students that are English learners really have had uh, significant challenges and families of English learners and those with special needs are, are really, we need to really work 110% uh, to find ways to connect. One of the things that the English learner families that I was on a webinar with them uh, a couple nights ago said is there was so much communication coming from different portals, it was overwhelming for them. And can we streamline the way that we communicate in an online remote setting? And then students that have special needs, there are there's such a wide range of, of ways that you have to personalize what they need because they're all at different levels. But how do we support the families emotionally as well as uh, with academics when their student is going to be learning from home more than, than in the past? Uh, I don't have the answers for that, but I know that we have a great team in place at the district that is, is having conversations around how do we support students with special needs every day and are working in creative ways to try to uh, if we are going to be, schools are never going to be the same, it, how can we make them better for students that have those particular challenges? Yeah, and, and just some of the points that were made earlier, you know, when this school year resumes, um, you'll have had some prep time. <laughs> it's not just suddenly like, well, school's closed indefinitely. Um, so uh, that's going to give you some time to learn from some of the things that you've just been, you know, been thrown into the fire and um, implement some of, the, I think, the beneficial um, advantages of, of integrating technology a little bit more, you know, like the individualization of people's um, interests and, you know, like some of the resources that Joanna mentioned, you know, for music. Uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to find another question here. So, um, and, and this is kind of speaking to what we've been going through recently. It, it, this is the question. It seems that the amount of time kids are supposed to be spending on Zoom for school varies wildly. Is it up to the individual schools or to the individual teachers? In terms of requirements, I suppose. Anybody? <laughs> Kelly, do you want to maybe answer? Yeah, I can, I can answer a little bit to that. Um, there definitely, I, I feel like the answer is there's no standard, there's no standard for it for this time period right now. Um, it was definitely um, suggested um, that the teachers meet with their, well, high school teachers meet with their students once a week on Zoom. Um, but that was totally left to the discretion of the teachers. Um, and depending on each teacher's home situation, that may be very, very different. Um, so I, I would say right now that the answer is, yeah, it, well, it's very different across the board. Um, if we have to move forward in this kind of environment, I think that will become much more standardized. Um, what I would say is that everyone did a really nice job in the beginning when the teachers were really rolling this out. Um, everyone was nervous. Everyone wanted to do a good job. Teachers are so sincere about being, um, you know, just about teaching students and wanting to connect with students. And um, they were so nervous about what we do. And, and of course, the first thing they went with was what we've always known. And so quickly everyone recognized that you can't translate all of that. And so kids were saying, I have too much to do. It's too much work. And we just really appreciated the feedback. I mean, most people were really kind about it. Like we know you're doing your best job you can. Um, 
So I definitely would just say that if, if your student is overwhelmed, um, check in with the teacher and see if there's any way to pull back. And if, if, um, and if not, you can regulate it yourself. Um, and I, I think though moving forward, it, this becoming a norm for education in any way, I think there will be much more um, standardization around that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I, you know, having a children in high school as well, um, yeah, it, it did seem that um, things varied, but um, I think, again, it was just the immediacy of having to move in a direction that there was no plan to go there and everyone just did their best. Um, so it's nice to hear all the things that, that all of you have learned and, uh, and I feel more confident that if we have to do some virtual as well as in-person um, school, when you know school resumes, that it, it will be a little more standardized and people will actually you know, have a plan and I think the kids will be really excited. Um, so we have a question uh, for Joanna and it's just a simple one. So what is the name of the program that scores music? Somebody was interested in that. It's called Smart Music, uh, just smartmusic.com, and it's free through the end of June, I believe. After that, there is a fee. I can't remember how much it is, uh, but it's been really useful for students who already know the basics of playing instruments. I would not recommend it for students who are just beginning and need to learn how to put the instrument together and how to hold it. Uh, there are lots of YouTube videos you can go to for the very basic beginnings. Um, I also have lots of music teacher friends who would love to teach children on Zoom. Mm -hmm. um, but smart music's been really nice. It does, I will say though that it has a, s a steep grading curve. Uh, it, if, you're just, if you're not just perfect, it'll mark it as wrong. So I did often go back in and score the students higher. So I would just say, keep an eye on it if you have a child who's a perfectionist, because mm -hmm. they're going to see those little yellow notes like you were close, but not quite. And really it's acceptable for a beginner, um, but it visually, it doesn't always look that way. Thank you for that. So that's when the human touch of it was good enough <laughs> comes in and uh, makes the difference. So, um, okay, I think we just have maybe time for one more question before we need to wrap up. And um, this one uh, says, is there any ideas for teachers with school age children? Um, what will they do if the district goes with the hybrid model? Because as we have heard, some of you have your own kids. So has there been any discussion on that or any thoughts? Nope. <laughs> Kelly? I'll, I'll, I'll start again, maybe Bill. I don't know if Bill wants to chime in too. Um, I would less like to say um, that there are lots of conversations about that. I, I, I mean, that is a huge issue about what we're looking at moving forward. Mm -hmm. And so there's just a lot of conversation about it and there is not an answer yet. Um, as far as I know, and that's where I'm saying Bill may want to chime in. But um, at this point, you know, it's it's something that, you know, um, even the teacher union is involved with. And um, I, I noticed earlier, Karen McBride, our union put out there that there is going to be a survey coming home to parents as well, which I think I just wanted to highlight too, of getting feedback. But I think right now, um, as life has changed um, and each, you know, each week there are new parameters. I think there's as best of the planning as possible is going on right now, but we still don't know what it's going to be like in August. And so right now it's just a lot of conversations and a lot of awareness. Uh, um, so I definitely think it's just important for everyone to know that that is something that is being very seriously taken into consideration by the, our, our school leadership. Well, that's good to know. And thank you for sharing that. Bill, did you have anything to add or? Uh, not really. Kelly said it uh, really well. I do think that um, getting parent feedback is going to be important. Getting teachers feedback is going to be important. Community feedback around what this will look like if we have to do it. We've, we've, we've had a lot of, almost every plan we've made in the last eight weeks, we've made a plan, we feel really good about it, and then we get new information the next day and have to shift gears like we did with our graduation ceremony plan just this week. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, planning, uh, we make plans, of course, and we have backup plans. And then hopefully, uh, that's why we need the most input from as many people. Like, what about 
child care for working families and, and for staff and people who are concerned about health um, in terms of coming back and, and or maybe being immune compromised or having something in their family. And so there's a lot of unknowns and I think we're all trying to figure it out together. But we have, I would say to the community who's listening, the people that are at, at the board of trustees level, the district administrators, the site uh, leaders, the teachers, and all of our parents, we're all, we're all in this together. I know it sounds like a cliche, but keep the questions coming, keep the ideas coming, keep the constructive criticism coming. And the more we learn, the better we can help prepare the best for the fall. Thank you so much for that. Um, I've really enjoyed getting to know you all a little bit more and um, helping to facilitate this panel. Um, we will uh, come to our conclusion now. And um, I just want to really thank our sponsor for this webinar today, the Santa Barbara Education Foundation. Um, without their support and without um, their, you know, bringing together our panelists and you all um, have such you know, depth of knowledge and experience. And uh, thank you so much for just spending your time today. Um, you've been supporting our youth and investing in um, education with the parents uh, and the guardians and the educators. And we thank you for that. Um, we will be sending out a, um, a survey to all of the people that attended today. Uh, just asking you what you thought about the content, the relevance, and just maybe some other um, ideas for future webinars, because similar to what you've all shared, um, News Talk has never really done a webinar series before, but here we are doing this um, because of COVID. And I think um, it's a wonderful way to engage with our readers in, in a way that people can log on uh, live or listen to the recording afterwards. And um, so we've, you know, um, decided that we're going to continue some of these things as we move, you know, into a more normal routine as well. Um, so again, thank you all for, for joining us today and everyone who logged in. We will be having a follow-up article written just as a recap of this webinar that will be published in News Talk, and it'll also have a, um, a link to the recording if you had to join late or leave early. So I um, invite you all to share that. and. Um, Hope you all have a great weekend, and this concludes our webinar for today. All right, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye and take care. Thank you.